Hey guys, uh, glad you could join us for another Red Letters uh, class. You know, I was thinking about what was something that I could share with you this week that might be really contextual, you know, things that are going on right now. Um, and then I had the thought, well, you know, we're talking about the words of Jesus. It, it shouldn't matter if it seems contextual or not, <laughs> right? Everything that Jesus says should be contextual to our lives, and if it's not, we need to figure out how to make it contextual <laughs> to our lives. Um, you know, and, and then part of me also was thinking, well, why don't I just find something really encouraging and, um, you know, just something short and pithy that Jesus gives that allows comfort for us. And uh, so I, I thought of two different things and then realized actually that they're kind of in the same chapter right here. And so I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 11. And I'm not going to uh, actually read through the, the whole chapter or anything like that. I'm just going to pause between each section, uh, put up the verses on the screen, and you can choose to pause the video if you want and read through it, or you can read through your own uh, version if you'd prefer that. And then I'm just going to comment a little bit on, on what I'm seeing and what I've learned this week, uh, questions that, that I'm thinking through. Um, so, so let's go ahead and start with uh, Matthew chapter 11 uh, in verse 1. So here you have John, who's in prison by Herod, because John, uh, as you know, was kind of condemning Herod's act of marrying his sister-in-law after his brother had died. Um, neither one of them were really fans of that, and so they threw John the Baptist in prison. I, I don't know how long he had been in prison up to that point, but you can imagine he's probably getting uh, discouraged. Uh, as uh, Maybe he expected it to a degree, and yet at the same time, uh, here his cousin, the Messiah, <laughs> is going around uh, and maybe in the back of John's mind, he's just thinking, any moment Jesus is going to come in here with an army of people and, and free me from this prison uh, or something like that. I, I don't know. But it does seem that John is in a state of confusion maybe even doubt at this point in his, in his life and in his ministry. And so he sends his disciples, and Jesus' answer, I think he's giving him, in a sense, um, listen, maybe what you were expecting, um, that, that was not the kingdom that I'm coming to bring. And certainly if John might have been confused about the kingdom and what Jesus was coming to do and to fulfill, certainly everyone else was, and we know that that's the case. Um, but Jesus essentially says, look at this, here's the evidence, look at what's been happening, and recalls, I think everyone's minds, back to Isaiah 35, which was a prophecy of what this new kingdom would look like, and all of these things, Jesus is just checking right off the list. Uh, of course, one of those things that's mentioned in Isaiah 35 is freeing the captives. Maybe John had that in mind, thinking, okay, well, he's, um, uh, he's proclaimed um, good news to the poor, and he has healed the sick, and the lame are walking, the blind are seeing, but the captives aren't free because I'm still here, so Jesus, what's going on here? Maybe that's some of what was going on uh, in John's mind, but... You know, even John had a season of perhaps doubt or at least confusion. And I think it's important to remember uh, in his case, but also bringing this to our own lives as well, when we go through confusion and we go through doubt, I think what's important is to remind ourselves and to allow ourselves to be reminded what the kingdom is really about. Uh, we're, we're going through a difficult time right now. We need to remember and remind ourselves, and, and if we've forgotten, we need to go back and look. What is the kingdom of God truly and really about? So in the 
this next section, he seems to be addressing everyone else's confusion, uh, talking more about John, kind of lifting him up, uh, kind of on, on a pedestal, almost in a sense, as being the one that the Old Testament did in fact prophesy, the one who would make the path straight. He was this prophet like Elijah who would come. And Jesus is, in a sense, he's not answering him saying, yes, I am the Messiah. He's going to be a little bit more subtle about that because his ministry isn't done. And I, I think he knew if he went around at this point in his ministry saying, yes, I am the king of the Jews and the king of kings. And yeah, Herod's going to come in and take him out before uh, he can really complete and fulfill his mission. Um, but Jesus, it, I, I think what he's getting at is that, you know, those with ears will hear the right thing. They will hear what Jesus is trying to get across. He's allowing the people to make the correct inference about himself through the things that are going on, to work out in their own hearts and minds who this Jesus really is. And I think that there's something in, in there for us as well. Uh, when I was a kid, and maybe it was like this for you too growing up, I kind of thought, well, I would be able to go into places and maybe read some Bible verses uh, and say, Behold, I am a Christian, and Jesus is Lord. And everyone would fall to their knees and praise God and want to get baptized. <laughs> like that was kind of my thinking as, as a young child. Uh, and, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not preaching against the, the power that words can have sometimes. Uh, sure, that there's, there's some amazing things God can do through that. But, um, you know, what is most often needed isn't for us to go into places and say, Good news, everybody, I'm a Christian. But rather, simply, to be about the things that Jesus was about. And by that, I mean doing the things that Jesus would be doing. To follow the Spirit in the work of the Spirit. And instead of, you know, uh, posting all of our opinions online and stuff like that, again, that's not a terrible bad thing. Um, but what is needed is for us to be out there doing the work of Jesus. Um, drawing people's attention to that the work that God is doing in the world and how his kingdom is in fact expanding and growing and the gates of Hades won't overcome it, nor will any other kingdom of this world. Uh, but to draw people's attention to what God is doing and allow them to make uh, the right inferences, to make the right judgments for their own lives and, and what their own life needs to be about. So in this section, uh, it's really interesting, Jesus is essentially just condemning their obstinate minds, okay? They are just unwilling to be moved or to change direction. He said, John didn't eat or drink when he came, and you called him demon-possessed. Uh, and I've come eating and drinking, and you're saying I'm like the rebellious son of Deuteronomy 21, right? A, a, a glutton and a drunkard who... Uh, if you read Deuteronomy 21, the parents are supposed to bring a rebellious son to the community and say, this son of ours is rebellious, and they would stone him to death. Um, I don't know if that ever happened or not, but it, it seems as if the people are saying, Jesus is like this rebellious son, we, pro we should probably just stone him to death right now. And Jesus is just pointing this duality out in their minds. It's, we, you know, you can't do anything right. Your mind is made up, and you're obstinate, and you're unwilling to bend, and to be moved, and to accept the kingdom uh, that, I, that I'm inviting you into. These people were unwilling to let go of their own kingdoms, their own power, their own possessions, their own influence, uh, their identity that, that they had built their life around. They were so stuck in their nationalistic thinking that convinced them that the only way to prove that they were God's you know, chosen people, chosen nation, was to go around stabbing Romans and lead about this bloody revolution and rebellion, which, sure enough, 
uh, Jesus was telling them uh, that sort of kingdom would end. And sure enough, it did within a generation. Rome comes in and wipes them out in 70 AD. Uh, you know, all of those, all of those cities, uh, but particularly Jerusalem. And arguably, if you read the history, it was worse than Sodom. Um, but I think of Jesus coming up to Jerusalem and weeping and saying, Jerusalem, I longed to gather you as a hen would gather her chicks under her wings, and yet you didn't even want it. Um, I think that there's something in that for us in this section also. It's, it's not just a warning against allowing your country to become an idol in your mind, um, which is, you know, basically is just civil religion, right? With the assumption that God would love, in our case, the United States of America, more so than any other country or any other people in the world. Um, you know, we could get caught up in, in that kind of thing, but even on an individual and a spiritual level, if you allow your identity and your priorities and your passion to be caught up with that, then we fall in real danger of missing or even denying the invitation to live in the one and only kingdom that will not end that way, that won't end at all. And denying that invitation is a judgment that is worse than death. So we have another invitation at the end that uh, Jesus gives us just to kind of end on maybe a more positive note. For the Jews, gaining godly wisdom was the pinnacle of pursuits. Right, uh, But to them it meant a lifetime of being a Ph.D. student, uh, learning other languages, maybe certainly just diving into uh, the, the scrolls, the Old Testament, and just dissecting every little word and every little detail uh, and all of that. And here comes Jesus saying, no, you don't need that ivory tower elite kind of lifestyle or thinking uh, to gain wisdom. You need to be like a child. Um, not, it's not by studying books, though I don't think Jesus or certainly Paul would ever condemn <laughs> studying, of course, right? But that's not um, the main avenue by which wisdom is gained. Rather, it's living in the presence of Jesus that wisdom is gained by watching Christ and imitating Him in my own life. That's how you gain wisdom. And I'm sure Jesus is just looking around at all of the people that are following Him and just having this, uh, I don't know, recognition, this realization that here you've got the poor. Uh, you've got tax collectors and you've got sinners and you've got common fishermen who were learning more about the presence of God and drawing closer to God than the Pharisees ever could simply because they were following Christ. Uh, the, the Pharisees told people to take on the yoke of the Torah, which uh, again was simply following every single command um, and law to the letter, both written and also including the unwritten oral traditions that have been passed down from, from uh, generations, uh, you know, extra stuff that they were putting on the people that Jesus also condemned them for. Um, but Jesus says to take his yoke, which is easy to bear. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that's not to say that following Jesus is easy, because I think we know that it's not um, so often. After all, he said that taking up one's cross might, for some, mean leaving even family. Uh, for many, it might mean leaving possessions. Um, and certainly, it's about putting off um, you know, your own life, passions, pursuits, and giving all of those things over to God, but the sense that one should get 
from putting those things in God's hands. Family, relationships, possessions, my future, all of that. The sense that we should get is an overwhelming sense of rest and peace and relief and relaxation and refreshment. I didn't mean for all those to start with ours, but they did. <laughs> but yeah, putting those things in God's hands ought to bring rest, relief, refreshment. Um, so, you know, so I'm just praying for that for each one of us. Um, for one, that we might recognize which earthly kingdoms and which citizenships we might be Allowing, our, allowing to obscure our vision of and our passion for the kingdom of God. And then secondly, that even as we flesh out our salvation with fear and trembling, as Paul would say, that we experience daily the rest and refreshment that God gives, that Jesus brings in our lives as we abandon those other kingdoms and give our lives um, to Christ. So we'll see you guys next week.